visible on here. Like when you leave yours, I'm sorry. When you leave yours, those two lights, those such a glare on the screen, you can't see it on the video. Uh, uh, which two lights are you talking about? These two. What if you just turn one side off and like one side off? They're all on the same side. The lights? I'm talking about. You see the lights off. I don't know. I'll ask you for the uh, yes, if we get these two lights can be off. It yeah, helps the screen. Them all yeah. out. They don't have to rewire that. Maybe we need to go down and turn them off. I got a beat again. Yeah. Well, the lights are each week, so I just have to vacuum. <laughs> but those, those are off, but this becomes visible. It's some wire snacks. Anyway. <laughs> And as you get electrocuted, it's going to fall off the seal. We were living in a we were living in Spring Branch, old house, and I went to the attic to try and get some wiring, old wiring. The old wire, you know, if you have to notice or not, they, they have a constant hot that runs through it. And for that instant, I became the condenser. Not the ball of fire. So <laughs> when you woke up. When I woke up. And you're on the bottom floor, you know how you got No, 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 still up in the attic. From what I was like, so what's up there? I go, I don't know, what's happening? She goes, there is this stuff. Okay, I'm going to have to turn it in for the house. Yeah. Yeah. I spit the wire. Yeah. I learned you have to just kill the whole power. <laughs> Work on the wire. Yeah, I was, even even after I do the breaker, I still I still touch it. Just hit it with something metal. Well, you get your um, multimeter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you if you have one or if you're not done with it, let me know. That's my one either. <laughs> 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 I have them every time I need it, I can't find them. It's when I'm looking for something else. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I, I usually work on 110 Live, but I'll trust. Well, that line is not good yet. So. If there's one, you forget it. I'll even try. Well, I did change, uh, I did change a uh, dryer outlet one time. It was, it was uh, too funny. Yeah, I was really careful. But yeah, I should have done it. I had an electrician. God, was amazing. He'd come out and he would grab the switch. Uh, so work with his. Yeah, yeah, it's live, right? Yeah. Like, how do you do it? As long as he's still in touch, yeah. I'm fine. He's got to be careful. He's got to be careful. Right? But he would, oh. and he would work so fast. It's like, holy oh, cow. I just did that time Exactly. Hello. Uh, And when you're going through, you never want to fall. No. Of course. Yeah, 
So everybody got sworn in. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Bears double joint. I didn't see that game. But that was second one. That was the second one from what I heard. That was the second one. No. Oh, I got that. I got that. But that was the second attempt. I heard that they called time out. But it was one of the second they called the time Yeah. Vision update. Uh, let's see. Our church family has raised $1,726,370 in a little over a month. 
So this is the Envision is the building, mm -hmm. the new youth building fund. How much do we need to collect? I don't know. 14? 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. Okay. You're saying the total is 14? 14 million. 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 Okay, the lead next ministry leadership summit, which is for anyone who's any kind of leadership position here, uh, is Sunday, January 27th, from 5 to 7 in the worship center. <coughs> and lastly, uh, journeys come up. <laughs> Don't stop believing. <laughs> So the dates for that are February 5th and the 17th. So if you are interested, you can register at sagemontchurch.org slash students or contact Tracy Cox. Today is Clearland's Hot Luck Lunch Open House right after church. So I said 1.30 in the email, but, you know, you can just go with this. Straight from here. Over, am I going to read a little early so we don't get right. all excited on the phone? Okay. All right. So, requests? I haven't praised. Well, I can say My mother <laughs> went in for her second of the third and night, and he gave her a pass. And then the cardiologist on the 10th, he gave her a pass. I had to get a new cardiologist too uh, next year because this. This one is off of the Lewis here at his office. She has to go to Jerry chair where they lean back and she can't sit in the wheelchair. So, anyway, but at least I found a new cardiologist next year because she's required to see a cardiologist every year. But anyway, her previous cardiologist gave her a pass and our trust for our farm all came in, lined up everything. So, I picked it up. Also on the tenth, so our farm is safe. Yeah. Oh, actually safe. Great. So your brother signed off on that? Yeah, my oldest brother that was giving me a hard time. I had him read over it and browse over it, and he said, "Okay." Wow. That was the only hurdle. Yes. And it says in there. That this farm will not pass out in the blood line. So I don't know that he read it correctly, but I, he, he accepted it and it said that blood line included people who were adopted who did not adopt the state. Yes, mm -hmm. they were adults. And, and it has to be biological or something like that. So good. Yes. Nice. And that's the way my parents are going to be it anyway. Like watching a, a 
gaming DC event, it will do the same thing over and over and over and over. And it'll jump to another thing and like the cabinet's doors just push on and push on and push on and push on. And, you know, it was almost late for the bus because I couldn't get him out of the house to put a hand lotion on. It's just so hard. But then, he's, then, he, then it's okay. There are these moments where it's just a skipping record, skipping DVD, and it's really taxing. So we're just praying that, you know, how to move forward on that and how to help him help him get out of that because it's, it just is a way. You know, even, even he doesn't like it. So um, we just pray for, for his OCD to go away and. We don't want to put him on another med, and we don't want to increase the one we have. So just healing for that particular thing. Um, it's. I know. Well, don't say that. <laughs> she would say, "Don't speak that out loud." God can do it, but it, but it's just like we can put them back on that one med, and it'll take care of it. We don't want anyone on the anti-psychotic anymore. He's not psychotic, but a lot of times they say kids are lost with illness. But it's been eighteen years. Now. Yeah. But there's oils and stuff, like essential oils that are supposed to handle that. And we're, she, she, does, she does all the research on this stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that and um, natural calm stuff. All, you know, so we're, 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 for that are not, uh, yeah, so we're, we're doing those. Then we just need to know prayer and if there's something else we can get on that would be helpful because it really is it's hard. It's hard. You know, it's just when you're out, you got to stop and just. Try to get a hold of it. And the travel is just like this personal. And yeah. And you just want to keep it. Yeah. But there's a happy thing we can pray for for Joe and Amy. Uh, Amy and their daughter Emily has got friends to get married. Uh, that all finally got decided. It's decided and so they kind of hang in there and they got but uh, of course, there's lots to do going to plan a wedding. So we just pray back for that family that will have peace in their hearts while they deal with a lot of craziness that goes on and changes. Yeah, I'm saying keep it simple. It's just yeah. easier that way. Exactly. Ours, was, ours was really good, but it was simple. We didn't go for it. You know, we spent we spent a lot of money, but we got what we needed. And, it's fun. You know, I had a say in it. So you had a say in it? I had a say in it. Holy cow, Kim, what's the matter with that? You want to do this? Yes or no? No. <laughs> 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 it was still saying. But we just we had fun. <laughs> and, 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 and good and people. Yeah. Yeah. We had real good people help us out. Yeah. Great. Y'all are fun people. I mean, we were not. Oh, you gotta see us at home. <laughs> They're not fun when you're beating with Scrabble. <laughs> you were a little closer. Was, uh, you were within a hundred points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you. We're all here, and we get be in this class. God, we pray for our elected officials again. They need all the help they can get. Pray for the ones who are really trying to make a difference. Um, we pray for this stalemate with the with the budget and the wall. Just pray, God, just it'll you'll fix it, push it forward somehow. Pray for um, uh, praise for Carolyn's mom getting getting um, approved. Uh, being able to move forward and just as a, a new cardiologist, pray for uh, Texas. Country is one thing, but Texas is another. I have a lot of pride for Texas and just the people here. And God, I just pray for this this country, this, this Texas country, to to do it better than everyone else. I think to, to be a to be um, a leader for this country. To, how to do government right? How to do these people right? Just pray, God, for our elected officials there as well, that we help the great ones to get elected. Uh, I pray for Barb and her mom in an accident in the car. God, I pray that you will heal them and um, they'll come out of that without any issues. Pray for my son's OCD and medical issues. God, for healing for that. Keep healing. And then also for uh, Emily as she's planning a wedding. God, just pray for all that to go really well. Amazingly well. Thank you that we're here. We love you, God. And we ask you to in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.
YouTube, y'all could get a pair of glasses for me and my sons, and we could do it live here. Because <laughs> we're, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. So uh, if anybody wants to go for a ride in the car with me, it's red, green, deficient. And so, uh, yeah. Well, so I've been told. Yeah. So. Red and green. That's why my first choice when I went in the Air Force, I got denied. Uh, they wouldn't let me go in and do imagery analysis. Imagine that. Uh, so, if that's true, you need to check the graph. I mean, the people are just, it's not the instructions say wait 10 hours. I'm telling you, you can see it in 10 seconds. You know, I, uh, I'm not, it's not like dog vision. I don't see 256 grayscale. You know, I, I, I see colors. I usually get them wrong, though. Uh, that's why Amy, Amy, we we all have a, a check before we walk out the door. Yes, that matches. You're good. Yes, that matches. You're good. So you don't pick out the carpet colors. Uh, only did once. Um, <laughs> so it's like, what do you mean blue and burgundy doesn't go together? So says you. All right. Well, thanks for that, John. And and um, yes, you all that do have good color vision. Be thankful because it does get in the way of a lot of things. Even my son had a dream to be a pilot and they're like, absolutely not. So, but today we're going to be talking about, we're going into part two, which was actually part of part one. Yes. Last week, we're actually going to get into the little bit more into depth on the holiness of God uh, this week. Last week, just kind of running through these slides real quick. We talked about why should we study God's holiness? We talked about the differences between knowing God versus knowing about God and how we come to those conclusions. We talked about worldly views of God, and we walked through a few of those and, and had some discourse around different views of, of God based on the worldview. And that led us into looking at language of holiness in the Bible and talked about the Kadesh word group in Hebrew, and we talked further about where the Septuagint refers back to the um, the word holy in Hebrew, and it uses the ag root of uh, in, in Greek, which points back to the Old Testament. So we know that when we look at the context of where we're going to study holiness or this concept of holiness and holy, we know that the majority of our scholarship comes out of the Old Testament. 
because we also looked at it from an ancient world uh, textual uh, viewpoint, looking at, you know, what is Akkadians, what was their major themes throughout their literature, some of the North Semitic um, people groups and so forth. And so today we start our lesson as we begin to understand holiness in the Bible. And what's interesting is when you read through the Bible and you look through the Old Testament and the New Testament, if you were to just do a word count of words describing God, there's no other word in the Bible that God has described more with than the word holy. When you look at whether he's described as just, whether he's described as righteous, whether it's talking about actions that, God's take, that God takes or his attributes, holy is the most often adjective that is attached to his name. And so just by that, we can attribute that God's holiness is, if not the most important, it is definitely within and arguably in the top two attributes that are um, important to God's uh, attributes and, and how we understand God. So what some, some verses that we find in Holy, we're just going to pull three verses from different parts of, of the Bible. We read first that God alone is holy. So if you looked at Revelation 15, 4, Revelation 15, 4 in John's uh, writing, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. God is also glorious in his holiness, as we read in Exodus 15, 11. It's Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? And then in, in my, my favorite passage in the Old Testament in describing God's holiness, when we look at Isaiah chapter 6, um, specifically verse 3, we see that God is, is celebrated in his holy, holiness, and he's celebrated unceasingly. They, they, they don't stop celebrating his holiness. The seraphim who are there, and they're crying out, and their cries fill the temple, and it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is, fill, is full of his glory. And we look at this in, in Isaiah chapter 6. We also see an allusion back to this when we, if we go back to Revelation, when John is witnessing the account in heaven and he sees the seraphim there in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. It's Revelation 4, 8, where they are declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. What's interesting is we, we think about, you know, our relation to God. And, and part three of the lesson is we're going to talk about how we relate to God. Today, we're still diving into what it means, holiness, and what this separateness means, this holy being separate from all of his creation means. Next week, we're going to talk about as part of that creation, how do we relate to God and his holiness? And how do we rate, relate to a fallen world being his children? And we are called to be holy like him. How do we relate to both of those aspects? But today we're going to talk more about this attribute. And what's interesting is, is when you dive through a lot of the scholarship on this, and, and I probably pulled through 15 or 16 different texts just to put this, this piece of the lesson together, um, this introduction. Holiness is one of the most debated attributes about God as to what it actually means. It's one of the most important attributes, but it's one of the most misunderstood and it's one of the most misconstrued attributes of God. And so the, in, in, you know, it's it, the precise meaning of holy and holiness is debated. And so as we get into talking about it being the separateness, I'm actually choosing just one path of scholarship on holiness. What's interesting is, is that as you see the different paths of scholarship, you'll, you'll also begin to see them blend. You'll see one path of scholarship where they say it means his separateness. You'll see another path of scholarship that says it's his transcendence. 
You'll see another path that talks about he is the holy other one, which then kind of blends together the transcendence and the and the separateness. And so it's really it's it's in different it's it's all over the place. But I think that it's it's healthy for us to take a blending of several different paths as we go down this uh, this path of separateness. So what do we mean by holiness as a separation? And so as we look back, and this is why we looked at the Hebrew word, the Kadesh word group, if we look at the original meaning of that, the etymology of that word, it means to cut or to separate. That's what the original word Kadesh meant, was cut or separate. And so that's when we look at that, we're talking about the holiness refers to more than just a separation by way of moral purity or righteousness or from sin and impurities. Many in the realm of scholarship, if you read like R.C. Sproul in his book, Holiness of God, which is a fantastic book. It's a great book, and it's it's not written at a real heady kind of level. It's um, I read that as kind of a primer before I started digging into the, the books that have the bigger words that I'm always having to right click and look up on. Um, it's a very accessible book. And, and he goes into talking a lot about understand you're talking about a being when you look at the universe and you see the billions and billions of galaxies and the billions and billions of stars in those galaxies and the billions and billions of light years that separate those galaxies and how vast. And you look at our sun and understand the importance of how large our sun is, our star, in comparison to our uh, our um, solar system. And then understand that that star is infinitely small compared to some of the other stars that are out there. And then you traverse all the way down to how small and insignificant we are in comparison to that universe. But then even go down even further into the cellular level and understand that God knows about every particle, every atom, all the way down to every quark that makes up this entire cosmos that he created. This is a being that we are worshiping, that we are in relationship with, that loves each one of us and knows every hair of our head. And he created all of this ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means out of nothing. Okay, so in other words, he didn't start from something and create. It was God, and he put everything in motion from nothing, from his own power. He spoke that into being. And so when we reflect on his holiness and we reflect on our ability to communicate with him, we have to understand first who he is. We can break this down really into four different elements when we look at this holy God and we study about this holy God that we are worshiping. First, we're looking at his majesty, the majesty of God. When you think of majesty, what is what kind of position would if you were to say someone had majesty? Or you were to refer to him as his majesty, what what kind of position would that person typically hold? So king, exactly. You'd be a king, right? Usually you. <laughs> true, true. But it would, so, but we could sum that up into some kind of monarchy, right? A monarchy position. Absolutely. Highest position in the land. Absolutely. And so we think of some other words would be dignity. We would, we would associate things like authority of sovereign power. So we bring in, we think of the sovereignty of God. What does sovereignty mean? Ultimate rule, okay. Anybody else? That sum it up good? Everything belongs to him. Everything's his. It's like over That's right. That's right. That's right. Everything belongs to him. 
Edward Sovereignty is kind of fun just to break it down because it's got rain and it, that SOV, uh, I don't know what that means. But it's well, it's solely over rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think of that, thinking of his stateliness or grandeur, we think of it is the characteristic of a king and concerning God, the king and sovereign over all. So what I wanted to do is, I forgot to have this out and prepared before, but that's okay. Oops. When looking at this, um, if you guys, if you have your Bibles with me, follow along in Isaiah 6. I uh, mentioned this before, but we're going to, I think Isaiah 6 mentions best God's sovereignty and it gives us that picture. It says in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. You know, we have this illusion and distinction to kingship. You know, and our, our 21st century minds have a hard time grasping monarchy. It's very difficult for us in our culture to understand the concept of marketing, uh, monarchy. You know, um, we, tend to, we tend to think that we have a God that we can negotiate with. You know, we tend to think that we have a God that, you know, it's okay. I know I messed up a little bit. It's okay. He's, we, we want to forget about the holy side and just focus on the forgiving side. And yes, we do have an infinitely forgiving God, but we forget the, the fact of God's position towards sin. And it's his holiness and his position towards sin that, that should have us better understand where our position is in relation to God's holiness. Now, where, while we may have that challenge in the 21st century, understanding his sovereignty, ancient Israel, and even those even a few hundred years ago, Americans of a few hundred years ago that established this country, they would have had no mistake or no question as to what it meant for sovereignty. Because see, a king's sovereignty here on, on earth was absolute. You go before the king and, and the king is unhappy with what you have to say, or the king is just unhappy, <laughs> okay, you, you could lose some weight above your shoulders really quickly, right? And so. When, we, when we're thinking of terms of democracy, as I mentioned earlier, we also think in ways of having a say in things. I've heard, I've heard people say, if I were God, I would do it this way. I'm glad you're not because you kind of mess it up. Or I think God should do it this way or I think God should do it that way. And what that's doing is that's putting themselves in – the, on the throne. That's taking the crown off of God's head, the sovereign crown off of God's head, and putting on our head. Now, let me ask you this. What do you think would have happened a few hundred years ago? Someone walks into King Henry's court and says, hey, let me borrow that. He puts it on their head. How, how, how well do you think that would go over? They wouldn't have a head. Exactly. It would not have anything to put it on, right? <laughs> So, so when we when we think about that, you know, we it, again we need to, and this is not to take away God's love and lovingness, but we also have to have a healthy balance when we when we understand that God's sovereignty is not a democracy, 
His sovereignty is absolute. Go ahead. It's interesting how it kind of plays around because, you know, we see, we see it kind of play out in the culture from Wells Fargo and the movies, plays, you know, et cetera, and everything. But where, you know, there is maybe some king, you know, like, you know, say, like in those few movies and TV shows, the kings and, and the people and, and his subjects, if you will, like, are, are, are in total devotion to the king, if you will, and will, like, lay down the life for him. And, what the king says, I've got to do it, even though it may be wrong to them, I, I, I've got to do that. And uh, it's interesting how we see this play, you know, play out, you know, yet we don't kind of translate that to, you know, how we feel about God. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I think, you know, that there are some, I mean, perhaps maybe, you know, maybe in, in here in America, you know, we have democracy and everything, you know, sometimes we have kind of someone, someone knows that an authority or he's just a man, et cetera, and like that, but in those things. You know, where there was a king, king says this, the queen says that, you know, it has to be done. And you see the subjects that, at least in, in, in these movies, play the center and everything. I'm, I'm sure, like in you know, this, um, the old, old English days, if you will, where the people were just, the king says this, you know, you do it by order of the king. And, and then they follow all the law for the most part. You know, and there, there's a reverence there. But yet, you know, we still don't have the reverence for God. You know, it's like where God says this, and, and there's no fear. I mean, there's like no respect. Like you said, you know, we had twice when you were pushed me. You know, we're, we're back in those days. There was no, there, you know, there was no, oh, uh, maybe tomorrow. Whatever. Right. You know, it's like right. today. You know, so. Yeah, we see it from a standpoint of, and, and when we when we begin to embrace this, we, we can go too far to one side and start thinking and, and approach it from a negative attitude of, well, God's just being a dictator. And we see it as this dictatorship, and we we associate this with negative images of worldly dictators. But what we have to do is, before we go down that path, we need to take a look at the next attribute, which is God's will, and what God's will is. Yes, John. Well, if you go back to the Middle Ages, so, I mean, people in England or France or England, they believe. Right. And when they were talking to the king, they were talking to God's earthly representatives. So right. There, there was a, that level of sovereignty and holiness in their mind, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. This is this really good point. I was saying this being from the day, I mean, like, Right. Right. That's why as as Christians and we, you know, we won't get into that aspect of it. But as Christians, even though we may not agree with the officials that are elected, we are supposed to um, adhere to the laws of the government, provided that they don't what? Contradict God. To contradict God. That's right. Yeah, that's where John and Peter end up in jail. Yeah. Because yeah. you're saying this, it doesn't coordinate with God, we're going to do what God says. You know, and you're going to go jail. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. 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 Because you know, like you know, you know, like the current, you know, the, the current administration, the previous one, and all that. It's like to me, it's like just God has control as to what's putting these pieces into place, and we may be like, what in the world is going on? Why are they doing this? Why is he doing this? Or why is that group doing this? But you know, once you kind of take that biblical view, that's like you know, God is in control because there is an end game. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there is an end game here. And, and, and we see, you know, this God in the Revelation and what God kind of actually is. And God doesn't make many mistakes, you know? Like, you know, we may think, oh, you know, this whole political thing is just a big mistake. No, it's, it's not. You know, it's like going on for Ryan's trust. Right. And we're to do one thing. One thing. That's obey. Let me add the sovereignty of God. It's got a lot of parts underneath it. Obey. Man's law to the extent that it doesn't contradict God's will is, is part of it, but the amount part of that about 
uh, when Paul was telling them to obey the authorities of Rome, was the other scripture says, uh, when they say, as much as they say, me, they please with all of them. And uh, part of what was happening was that Paul did not want Roman authorities to see the Christians as being rebellious. And he was trying to instruct them to be peaceable people and to go as far as they could to cooperate with the Lord, blah, blah, blah. So the sovereignty of God is, of course, always true, but there's some parts to it that make it more human. Yep. And this, he's this, this instruction about being at peace with all men to the extent that you're able to, um, is, is a sweet side of God. To, you know. And then also, of course, at times he makes people go his throat because it's so evil. So, you know, that's just one thing. Yeah, it's, well, you know. just come from Paul, that came from Jesus himself. Well, yeah, sure. Because yeah. Jesus made it very clear to the apostles that he wasn't there to take over from the Romans and yeah. to establish a his kingdom yeah. eventually. So, so moving to the second attribute, which is underneath holiness as separation, we get into talking about his will. So we talked about his majesty, all right? We talked about his sovereignty, but when we get into talking about his will, we have to understand this is the attribute that actually makes it personal. You see, if, if, if there wasn't a will or a divine desire, then you, you have more of this abstract of what it means for holiness. It's, it's a more abstract or arbitrary idea. The second, the second attribute, as we get into, we're going we're gonna to wrap up with the fourth attribute today, but they're very closely intertwined. The fourth attribute under this is getting into God's righteousness, but I'm, I'm mentioning it now because we're going to get into that uh, in, in a little bit. When you, become, when you look at something being abstract or impersonal, if it were abstract and impersonal, we would then fall down the path of morality being abstract morality being subjective okay versus objective morality because it's with god's will and him being the standard of righteousness that we understand where morality falls into play without that will without that righteousness we have no transcendent measure in other words no measure above man to place objective morality on does that make sense? Just okay. So I want to I'm going to quote a, a few folks here as we talk about the the will. Dr. James Boyce in Foundations of the Christian Faith explains this about God, God's will as it relates to His holiness. If we ask what God's will is predominantly set on, the answer is that it is set on proclaiming Himself as the Holy Other. Remember, I talked about how you had these blending of the of of uh, scholarship, Dr. Boyce falls into that holy other or transcendent view of what God's holiness is. Proclaiming himself as the holy other, whose glory must on no account be diminished because of human arrogance and willful rebellion. In the element of will, the idea of holiness comes quite close to the jealousy of God which modern man we find so repugnant. You know, when we think about we serve a jealous God, that can conjure up negative connotations in our mind of we think of jealousy as in, you know, wow, he has a better basketball than I do, right? And so I want to go take it. But the jealousy of God that we're talking about, and you guys have probably heard that it's equated to the, je the righteous jealousy between marital partners. And that jealousy is is right in that no other should be able, no third party should ever be able to inject themselves into that marital relationship. Likewise, God's jealousy is that no other, no other thing, no other object, no other person, no other idea should ever supplant God from his holiness. And his will is focused on proclaiming his righteousness, his holiness, and his sovereignty throughout all of his creation. And it's when we get off the mark 
sinful in our thoughts, our ideologies, in our directions, we begin to put things on that throne in God's place. And so his will um, is, you know, rightly understood is the idea of jealousy um, uh, around his rightful place uh, of our worship. Dr. Emil Brunner, in his book, The Christian Doctrine of God, points out that this jealousy, as I mentioned, is, a prop, is properly analogous to jealousy within the marriage. And he concludes that the holiness of God is therefore not only an absolute difference of nature, but it is an active self-differentiation. It is the willed energy of, of which God asserts and maintains the fact that he is wholly other against all else. The absoluteness of this difference becomes the absoluteness of his holy will, which is supreme and unique. So that, that was a whole lot. And that was from a couple of those books that I said had really big words that I have to look up a lot. So how do we summarize all that? What would we, how would we summarize that in simpler terms? Basically it's God means that God is not indifferent to how men and women regard him. Just because we have the freedom now to thumb our nose at God doesn't mean that he's indifferent to that. Doesn't mean that he just turns a blind eye. That when we talked about some of those other world views that look at God as an object of mockery or look at him as some kind of caricature of the big man with the white beard in the clouds. That's and, and God's not going to met out his justice and his judging on our timetables. It's on his, but it will come because he's not indifferent to that. Yeah. There's something very sweet and personal about the jealousy of God that kind of takes it out of the theoretical um, and really touches my heart. And that's God wants us to have no other and all that, but. God wants us to love him. And that's in a way the other side of the coin that God's jealousy you know, you don't have anybody. But he he yearns for us to love him. One of the scriptures in the New Testament, and that's all I can remember, but the Holy Spirit uh, something over us is you know jealous for us. What is that verse? Uh, but it's it's kind of stands alone because you don't hear that angle of it very much. But God God burning for us to love him, okay. as he should, yeah. for all that he's done. Absolutely. Go ahead, John. I was thinking about exactly what you were talking about some years ago in the movie where George Burns played God as kind of to be honest with him. And then I guess we have the same thing going on with the TV show, again, which I haven't seen, it's called God Casted Me. No, I didn't mean. That was a TV show. But it's kind of like Yeah, I would recommend it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know whether that's trying to diminish you or not. But, uh, no, 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 it doesn't. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, so the, when, we, when, we look at, when we look at that, and those are all, all Great comments there and and very true. I think that what we have to understand is that, you know, when we think about God's jealousy, he's coming after us as someone who is crazy about us and loves us because he created us. I mean, and, and I'm not I'm not diving into next week's lessons because this is not a part of it, but I think it's for us to grasp some of the importance of this in, in understanding the Trinity and the eternality of the Trinity. Okay. You had perfection. You had perfection. This is before creation perfection that went back. You had perfect love. There was no pain. There's no sorrow. It was perfect. And you had the father, son, the Holy spirit, the triune God in a loving relationship. And it was, an outflow of that love that God would introduce and create a world to where others could freely choose and love him. 
He didn't have to. He doesn't need us. Just the fact that we exist, just the fact that we can even talk, that there is a Chuck, that there is a Steve, is something that we should glorify God for and be so thankful and humble that in spite of knowing well, Steve's perfect, so it's not a whole lot of heartbreak. Whoa. Steve, but no. <laughs> no. But in fact, in, in, in knowing already how bad we would mess up, he already knows how we're messing up tomorrow. He's probably already knowing how bad we're going to mess up just merging on the freeway going home from church. Okay? But in spite of that, he still, even though he was in perfect harmony and love, created us for the purpose of, of loving him. And he's chasing after us. And you know, they talk about the hounds of hell, right? Well, not to care make a caricature of anything, but the Holy Spirit is chasing after us, and it is his will that we would reunite with him. That's a loving jealousy. That's a crazy. That's a, yeah, absolutely. But now that we've talked about that, we need to go on to the third attribute, okay? And to be rightly positioned for our lesson next week, we need to also talk about God's wrath. And this is an essential part of God's holiness, but is not to be compared to like an emotional human reaction to something or a reaction which we would normally think of as anger. See, and we, and, and even in the Old Testament, we see passages where we hear about the wrath of God being poured out with his anger. Okay. And as, as you study, you know, how the, the inspiration of the Bible, you, you understand that, yes, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is God's word, but God also gave the liberty of the authors to have their own personality into the writings, okay? And so when we look at some of the passages, we have to be careful to not interpret this as a human emotional anger, you know? Somebody pushed me, so I, you know, cracked them right in the jaw kind of anger. That's not what we're talking about here, okay? The wrath of God is... Is, is not like any emotion we know in a human experience. It's rather, it's that necessary and proper stance. It's a pro, should be understood as a proper stance of the holy God to all that opposes him. Okay? Understand God's holiness. When we think about, think about Moses when he was like, God, I, I, you know, he's pleading, with God, I want to see your face. Right? God didn't just say, hey, there I am. No, he said, look, I'm going to cover you in the cleft of a rock. I'm going to walk past you. And you can see like the trail of my holiness. And that physical effect on Moses itself, I mean, he was transformed. That's just kind of like barely, barely catching a glimpse of God's holiness. Okay? But it's this, and it's that proper stance, that the outflowing power from God that opposes all things that are that stand in opposition to God. And so let's read a couple of passages here that would um, uh, shed some light on on this and give us some illustration. If we look at Leviticus ten and verses one through three. As you're turning there, I'm going to finish with this. You know, he takes the matter of being God so seriously, so seriously that he would not allow, that he will not allow anything or personality to aspire to his place. Anything that were to aspire or try and transcend to God's rightful place would be immediately rejected. It's not, you know, when you think about Revelation when Jesus returns, it doesn't talk about this cosmic battle, you know, the struggle between God and to subdue the forces against him. No, it's like, I'm back. It's done. There's, it's not going to, it'll be really exciting for us, but it's not going to be this just 
massive war or battle. It's just, it's over. The king is back. So Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, we're talking about the death of Nadab and Abihu. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered it, offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. Does that word sanctified mean? That's right. Treated as holy. Treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be glorified. God is serious about his stance. He is serious about his holiness. Let's uh, fast forward and look a little further in scripture. Let's go to 2 Samuel. Chapter 6 and verse 7. I'm familiar with, with this. This is where they were moving the Ark of the Covenant, right? And you have Uzzah who is, who's traveling alongside the cart, and one of the oxen stumbles, and he reaches out, and he grabs hold of the Ark, Right? It says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. I just, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I, I'm going to be honest. When I, when I read this and when I read this, I think to myself, really? Come on. It's the ark of God. The ox stumbles. He reaches out. And he's dead? That's that's tough, right? But if we look in context to it, what did God say? Not touching holiness. Yeah. You can't touch it. Yeah, right. I just thought an ox, you know, an ox stumbled and we thought he was going to tumble over, but I don't think God would allow it to happen. You know, so I mean, of course, you know, we can kind of, you know, inject him with what could have, what would have happened if he wouldn't have intervened, if you will, for God. You know, I'm sure God you know, had quite a bit of control of the oxen and his army with where, you know, who wouldn't have fallen. So, good you know, point. You know, and, and, and um, your point is well seen, you know, for people who are just maybe. Coming into Christianity or looking or investing in Christianity, and they'll look at this and like, I want this kind of shot. You know, you know, where, you know, but then they remove the context of it because they don't realize, you know, who's right, who's the home, etc., and having faith, um, seeing all the miracles that have been done to these people, you know, and all that. And they, they don't see all that. All they see is some wrathful, vengeful, jealous, mean God that, you know, strikes the guy down for just trying to stop the and that brings us to the point of when you use the word God, who are you talking about? Because if you're talking about a God that would fall victim to an ox stumbling, the ark falling, then you're not talking about a God that created ex nihilo. You're not talking about a God that holds everything in control through his sovereignty, his power, his will. Right? I mean, nothing surprises God. Nothing happens too fast to surprise God. It's not like God was there going, oh, whoa, whoa, never saw that happening. Sorry, Lisa. Oh, James. You know, one thing that kept me in the sense of frustration, you know, you think about the fear of the Lord. And, and and you recognize that he's holy. You know, just like a power wire fall down across the street, and he said, Oh, traffic's coming. I'm going to leave the door and again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the same thing they do. That's, that's, right. that's a great analogy. And here they got the same power. 
And you're not handling it the way that you're supposed to handle that. And they will not handle it in the park the way they're supposed to. Good point. True. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a that's a great analogy. You know, and so in summarizing these two, I want to be cognizant of the time. In both of these passages, we see the outcome of someone not showing the proper reverence and respect for God. And to that analogy, if we don't show the proper respect for a down power line, we're going to get cooked. Yeah, you know, right? it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, you know, of course, this is more than me, but when Uzo, 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 Uzo did that, I'm sure, you know, you know, you know there was a little buddy there. It's like, oh, that's what happens. Right. <laughs> 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 okay, I got it now. Okay, got it. Got it. You know, okay, I'm not going to touch it. Yeah, yeah. That only happened once. We don't see Uza and his five buddies who did this. No. <laughs> <laughs> People allowed this to happen so that so that Uza was the only victim. Yeah, moving <laughs> animals on a cart that was never the way they're supposed to do it. I can correct the situation real quick. Yeah, just turn back a chapter or so, and you see the outbreak of plagues amongst. Villages who were holding the ark improperly. Right? Yeah, no, no. I mean, that's a great point. Is made. Uh, the, the ark was never meant to be carried on a cart. Yeah, by ark, that's true. By um, oxen. That's yeah. So God has a little grace there too, right? In allowing it. You know, so it would be improper for us to interpret this as some some kind of emotional outburst. Emotional outburst based on what happened. You know, this is this the proper interpretation is this is an outflow of God's power when not respected and interacted with properly. And the results results are devastating. You know, we'll talk we'll talk a little bit next week about you know what does it look like when he's not respected properly and those who are not respecting him properly happen to be alive at the second coming. It says a lot when somebody is hiding from his righteousness and begging boulders and mountains to fall on them. Okay. All right. So um, the last one, and, and we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here, but we're going to carry this into the final section, and that's his righteousness, because we want to talk about it's in his righteousness that positions us to how we are to interact with God. So that fourth aspect of him is his righteousness. Righteousness is a part of holiness due to its complementary entailment with God's will, right? So God's will is, we talked about that earlier, but it's the righteousness of his will that brings in that aspect of morality, that objective morality, to where it's not morality is, well, you do you, and I'll do me, and what's right for me is right for me. It doesn't necessarily have to be right for you. Because what happens is if we go down that path, and we'll get in next week, depending on time, we'll get into what happens when you have subjective versus objective morality. We'll talk a little bit about is God's morality based on his will? Is it just his will, or is it that God is... The um, or is it that is something outside of God? And so we'll get into a little bit of what's called the euthyphro dilemma next um, next next week or euthyphro dichotomy. Yes. So we have a clear example of what I call selective morality test. Uh, we talked about that before. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, sure. 
and and the sad thing about that, John, is I, I would I would love to to you know blast the uh, the the secular um, culture on yeah. that as well. But the sad thing is, is we find it even inside inside of church, right? And so we, but what we are called to be as people is called to be holy and to subject ourselves to God's sovereignty. And so when we look at this aspect of God's righteousness, it is not that what God wills makes it righteous. And it's not that righteousness is this abstract Platonian thing outside of him, it is that God himself, God himself is the actual standard. He is the independent moral standard of what is is right and what is holy and what is proper. And we'll talk a little bit, we're going to dive into those things a little bit more in depth next week around whether or not it's because God wills something, does it make it right? Or is is something right outside of God, and therefore God wills it. Okay, and the reason I'm gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that is because it comes up to what is called the Euthyphro dilemma. This is something that many uh, atheists, skeptics, whenever they try and argue about morality, they will use and throw out. And it's right here where we get into who God is, what it means of His righteousness and holiness, and what that standard is. That we split the horns of that dilemma. Yeah, it's called the Euthyphro dilemma. It was um, spell it. E U T H Y P H R O. Aiden knows. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> The peanut gallery in the back. <laughs> so the Euthyphro dilemma, just real quick, what 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 skeptics have said in the past is they'll say, okay, you talk about morality and you talk about God being the objective source of morality. Is it morally right because God wills it? Right? Well, if you say yes, then you can say, well, so God could have willed something else. And that would have been morally right. He could have willed that it's okay for us to um, torture children for fun. And if he and if he willed that because he because it's what he wills, then then that's that's good. So that's a problem, right? Well, so that's what say but you have to find the you have to have the foundation that says God cannot lie because he could will something different. He could will that. Yeah, you can lie. OK, because remember, when we use. Right. And so. Basically, whatever the Ten Commandments say, fulfilled completely. Right, but are the Ten Commandments moral, morally right, because God willed it, or is it that they are, or is it that God willed them because they are morally right? Yeah, because if he, because if they are right because God willed it, then God could have willed something different. If they are, if God willed them because they are right, then it is something outside of God. It is the moral standard is no longer God's moral standard. It's this, if you if you study like Platonian philosophy, there's a belief in abstract objects, like one is an actual thing. If I said there's one backpack on this table, well, there's actually one, there's two minus one backpacks, there's three minus two backpacks, and all the actual numbers in the world, they're real object, right? But, <laughs> so when we, so what you have is you have a dilemma, okay? And it's a false dilemma because a dilemma is where you only have two choices. And it, it, it's called putting it on the horns of a dilemma. The way we split that dilemma in the 
proper way of looking at God's morality is that God is the standard of morality. So it's not that he wills it and therefore it's righteous. It's not that he wills it because it's righteous. It's that God is the standard of righteousness in which all things that are right flow. Yeah, please. <laughs> God is not being, he's not holding allegiance to something outside of himself. Correct. There's no law that God has to obey. He is the law. Yes. He comes from him. Yes. But, you know, but you, when you said, you know, about God can't lie, that doesn't mean that it is, it isn't wrong for us to from time. And my time is a perfect example. As far as what I did for the soldiers, if she didn't lie, they would have died. She did the right thing at the right moment. And and she is honored as being part of the bloodline of David, part of the bloodline of Jesus. You know, because she did what was the right thing at that moment, you know. And in a way, and it wasn't a lie. Nope, they're not here. They've gone someplace else. The command of to for Saul to kill to kill the Amalekites. Liam is another example. Liam, you had. I don't know how relevant this is, but I um, and I don't remember what passage this was, but uh, I remember it mentioning that he was the word in the beginning. Uh, and I kind of that kind of points to uh, God being being the standard, God being yeah. His own word that can command it. John one one. Yeah. John one. Yeah. Yep. He's the 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 logos. Yeah. Yep. I think the saying that John cannot lie to say that God, you know, wouldn't. It's not saying that saying God would not will that a lie be told. For right for, for, for a correct right purpose, sure. you know, and we see it all the time. I mean, in the Bible. Like, so then the question goes back. So then, why is Rahab honored? Yeah, right. It's a lie. Right. Well, I get that. Yeah, no, I get that. Well, God can will evil. God can will evil for a good purpose. You know, I mean, he, he will the judge of thrown into a pit. I would, use, I would use Rahab as a great example of, well, there's God's forgiveness, isn't it? She, she did something completely against God's will, his righteousness, for the right yeah. thing in our world, yeah. and God forgave her. It floods her every because forget. Don't tell me there's not forgiveness in the Old Testament. It's forgiveness. Thursday, think of all the Christians who are smuggling Bibles into countries. Oh, that sinners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 One thing you know, uh, I thought about the Rahab situation there. Uh, it brought to the question: the Rahab told the truth. Do you not think I have a plan B? Who Who is it that you worship when you use the word God? Because now we're back to the ox stumbling with the ark. Yeah. Now, the the example that I, I brought up of Saul being commanded to kill the Amalekites is one that is brought up a lot when talked about, you know, uh, Dawkins uses it. Is God a moral monster? Right. right? But is it is it murder? Right. Is it murder? Is it murder that God commanded Saul to go in and kill the men, women, and children of the Amalekites? Does God not control earthquakes? Does God not control typhoons? Does not God not control hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes? He could have just as easily called upon something else to be the instrument of wiping out not a people that were following and worshiping him, not a people that were... Uh, in holy reverence of God, but a people that were thumbing their nose. And so, no, that's that in that situation, the Israelites as being told to go in and they, and, and by the way, they were told not to, they were told they were part of driving them out. Right. But they were told to go in and kill all of them, men, women, and children. Right. So then the next 
piece of that, not to dive into, we can no, dive into a whole lesson, but, you know, what about the children? Well, it could be argued that based on God's salvation of children that... But the question is, got to come back to Dawkins. Is, so you're saying it would not be right for God to tell somebody to kill Hitler. Right. Yeah. And Dawkins would have to keep consistent. He'd have to say, yeah, it'd be wrong for God to say that. Mm -hmm. Which trains credulity. Absolutely. Even after he said he went and accomplished his task, we know that he didn't, right? Because they come back and come back and come back. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, next week we'll um, we will wrap up with our position towards God's righteousness. All right. All right. Thank <laughs> you.